So in this video, I'm going to teach you how to make accurate predictions when betting on football matches. The mistake that a lot of people make is that they use gut feeling um, or some irrelevant statistic in order to try and place a bet or to try and profit from football matches. But what we're going to do is we're going to use some historic data. We're going to use a bit of statistics and we're going to get that to predict what the likely outcome of a football match is. That will increase your chances of winning and profiting. So let's have a look at that in this video. If you're interested in trading with BetAngel, then visit our website where you can download a free trial of BetAngel Professional and BetAngel Trader. If you want to learn how to use them, then visit the Academy where we give you a detailed structured walkthrough of each product. And if you're an existing user, then head on over to the forum where we have a load of files for you to download to customize and use within BetAngel. So one of the first problems that I solved in betting markets was how to price a football match. I was motivated in my teens to do this because I was trying to win the football pools, which I eventually uh, did successfully. But that was all based around trying to identify matches that were more likely to be draws or matches that were more likely to not be draws. That was the key motivator for me back in that time. But I gradually expanded that out in order to understand how to price football matches full stop. Um, and then I took that forward with me in my career. And the very first thing that I ever did on Betfair on a regular basis was actually price up markets because back in the very early days, nobody was on there actually offering odds. So I went on there and offered odds to people. And the way that I did that was used a bit of data to basically project forward and identify what I thought that the odds should be. Now that's obviously an advantage because from a betting perspective, you can find value. And from a trading perspective, you can see where the odds are likely to be and you can anticipate that price action. So let us examine exactly how you would do that. So when you look at a football league, uh, there's all sorts of data on there. How many times teams have won, drawn and lost and stuff like that. But in fact, I'm actually not interested in any of that at all. If a team has won three games in a row, that may mean something to me, but it's not the most important fact that you can find on a league table. The thing that we are most interested in are goals. And that is because that's how you win a football match. If you score more goals than your opponent, then you stand a much better chance of winning. It's pretty obvious, really. That's how football is played. And you find this across all different sports. So in tennis, the chance of winning a point on serve is one of the key metrics in horse racing. How fast does the horse run? Um, each sport has a metric that defines the outcome of that particular sport. And in football, it is goals. So when we look at a football table, that's the thing that I'm most interested in. I'm interested in how many goals a team has scored and how many they have conceded. And you're sort of saying, well, you know, we're looking at historical data here. You're, well, yes, we have to, because this will actually define uh, the model that we're going to use, how we use data um, and what that data is actually telling us. So let me give you an example here. If we look at the Premier League ending uh, May 2022, uh, we can actually see the outcome of the entire league there. But digging underneath that data will give us an idea of how we can use some of that data to actually project forward and forecast the outcome of individual matches. And one of the first things that I discovered how to do, and I have done a video that specifically discovers how I uh, worked this out um, and how you can use this, is um, how to actually identify matches where there are actually going to be no goals scored at all within it. If we look at the Premier League uh, from the season ending 2022, we can actually tell that there were 1,071 goals scored in 380 games. So if we divide one by the other, we get the average number of goals that are scored within a game. And that comes out at 2.82. Now, what we can actually do is we can actually draw a nice little graph that adds up all of those individual um, games and how many goals are each of those games. And it comes up with a nice curve that basically displays uh, the distribution of goals from zero all the way up to some of the higher score lines. And when you do that, um, what, you're, what you're trying to do from a mathematical perspective is you're trying to uh, come up with a formula that actually fits that curve. You can actually type in the average number of goals, uh, to put it into this formula, and it will spit out a number. That number is telling you how many games would have ended with no goals being scored at all. So if we basically put that formula into our Excel, um, type in the average number of goals, which is 2.82 in this particular occasion, it spits out a number near 6%. That is basically saying that 6% of the games in the Premier League would have ended with a 0-0 scoreline. If we do 6% of 380, that comes out at between 22 and 23. 
Um, and if we look at all of the results from the Premier League last season, guess how many games ended up at nil-nil? The answer is 22. So you can see that we've used a formula here to actually uh, predict the number of games that are likely to end nil-nil. And you can use this formula going forward. If you think the average number of goals is going to be higher than 282, then that will obviously change the, um, the number. And if you think it's lower, then that will change the number as well. So a higher number of goals than that will basically decrease that percentage. A smaller number of goals will increase that percentage. But I've shown you there that we can look at a league table. We can apply a very simple formula and it can tell us how many games ended with absolutely no goals at all. However, that's just the start. We need to dig a little bit deeper if we're going to use this in a sensible way. So this is the point in the video where we have to dive into a spreadsheet. Uh, but don't freak out because one of the benefits of uh, things like the BetAngel forum is that actually people have openly shared a lot of data uh, which you can use uh, to do all of these calculations. But they've also shared spreadsheets that will download um, and use some of the formulas that I'm going to describe here uh, for you automatically. You don't need to do any of the work, but I always feel it's important for you to actually understand the working and the process and the way that all of this works in order to, for you to really be able to use it to good effect. But also, you'll want to create a model that is slightly different from other people using different inputs um, and, and so on. So you want to apply levels of skill to it and a bit of your knowledge and a couple of different angles that maybe other people haven't thought of. So explaining how that all works is one of the most important things. Um, but yeah, if you want to go to the Better Angel Forum, you can download spreadsheets that have all of this in and it will pull in all of the data for you as well. So it's doing 99% of the work for you. But like I said, it's important to understand exactly what it's doing and why. So let's have a look at that now. So when we looked at the league table, we looked at it from a very broad perspective. We added up the number of goals, we worked out what the average number of goals was during the match, and this table here represents the total number of goals that each team has scored. So we can tell that uh, Manchester City had the most, the games that they played in had the most number of goals, but this isn't really good enough for what we want to do. We want to work out the chance of goals being scored between two teams. And obviously that's going to vary quite a bit depending upon whether they're playing at home or away. So the first thing that you would do is split this table into home and away tables. And that gives you a lot more information because the thing that we're after is not the total goals, which you can see here. And as we saw on that previous page, uh, Manchester City ranked highest for the total number of goals per game um, that occurred during in the league. And um, what we need to do is we need to split that out. So the reason that they had the highest number of goals was because they scored on average three and they conceded 0.79. But it was actually Liverpool that were the best at home over the whole of the season. Um, but they actually scored fewer goals, but they conceded fewer as well. So we come up with a thing called a supremacy, which is basically how many goals the a team scored more than they conceded. And you can see that Manchester City rank higher there. Um, and Liverpool ranked lower, but of course they conceded fewer goals overall. And this is sort of detail that we want to get into. We want to see how many goals were scored by the home team. Um, and also we want to know how many goals they conceded as well. And we can do exactly the same on the away table. We can actually look at the number of goals that were scored when a team played away and how many they conceded. And we can get and gather more information uh, from all of that uh, within there. So you can see if we look at the league table here, um, there's little bits that stick out. For example, Aston Villa uh, ranked fifth for the number of goals scored at home. They scored on average 1.53, but they actually ended up finishing 15th uh, on the home ta league table, as it were. And that was because they just conceded far too many. So you can see they actually ranked 17th. In other words, they conceded a lot of goals uh, when they were playing at home. But you can see, for example, Crystal Palace um, conceded very few goals when they played at home. Um, so their defence was pretty good. And you can tell that Aston Villa's defence at home wasn't very good. And we do exactly the same thing for the away table as well, where we can rank and break out how many goals were scored by the home and away team, whether they were playing at home or away. And then we can start to combine those together. And we can also do other things, like up here is the equation that we used before to describe 
the chance of there being no goals. And you can see here um, that it says for Liverpool, because they scored 2.5 goals on average at home, the chance of them scoring no goals is 7.59. And because Manchester City scored three goals at home on average, their chance of having a match with no goals is even lower. And then you can compare that to teams like Norwich, where the chance of them scoring no goals at home was significantly higher. And again, we replicate that for the away table. But you can also see here that we've got percentages um, for all of the other score lines. So we're basically saying here, what's the chance of there being no goals? One, two, three, four, five, six. And we could put as many on there as we want. And that's the bit that we're going to look at next. Uh, this table here is really more to do with trying to work out how many goals are being scored and conceded at home or away. And then we would use that data and put it into something a little bit more intuitive than we can see on this page. So let's have a look at how we use that data. So once you've done the work in terms of working out how many goals on average a team is going to score, and remember, you know, we're looking at historical data here, but the model that you use and the way that you price this could use anything whatsoever. It could be just a hunch or it could be a little bit more scientific than that. But basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, this is how many goals, if this match was played 100 times, on average the home team would score 1.8 and the away team would score 0.74. And once you have that, you can start projecting forward. We've already projected forward zero, uh, but we have to do a different calculation if we want to project forward you know, and look at what's the chance of there being one goal, two goals, and so on. And you can actually see that equation down here. This is the long form of this equation because when I came across this and I started using this um, and I started working out how to do this, uh, that was the way that you had to do it. It's not like nowadays where everything is truncated and available in a few key presses. I had to use the long form of the equation to be able to work it out. And what we're looking at here um, is a, a, a probability distribution. And there are an almost infinite number of these available. So each one fits to a certain case. And I'm, I'm making this point for a very, very, very valid reason. But yeah, back in 1996, I was working for an internet service provider and I published this and other things as a demonstration um, of how to create a web page. Um, and I actually did all of the stuff um, on that web page to do with probability. And this was the long form equation that I used for predicting correct score odds. Now, thankfully, you don't have to do this for, for two reasons. One is I'll point you towards a spreadsheet uh, where you can uh, get this information. It's available on the forum. Uh, but also on modern spreadsheets, it's really simple to do the same sort of equation. So if we want to predict one goal, what we would say is we'd go in and I'm going to use the Poisson distribution uh, to do this. Like I said, there are many different types. I'll explain in a second um, some of the limitations with what we're doing here. But basically, um, it's saying, how many goals do we want? Well, we want one goal. Um, the average number of goals scored is 1.8, and we don't want the cumulative function of that. So it's saying there's a 29% chance of the home team scoring one goal if they score 1.8 goals on average. Then we can do the same for the away team. We can basically say we want one goal, and on average they've scored 0.74, and we don't want the cumulative function. And then we basically multiply those two together. So you can see that's basically saying the chance of a one-all draw is about 10%. And that's what you can see up here because this spreadsheet here is doing all of that. It's looking at, you know, what is the chance of one-all? What is the chance of one-two? What's the chance of one-three? What's the chance of two-nil, one-nil? And it's basically combining that all together using the same function that I've just described down below. And um, like I said to you, you can download um, a spreadsheet that does a very similar thing on the forum and it also gathers the data for you. But one of the things you need to be aware of is different distributions have different positives and benefits. So one of the things I discovered when I first started doing this was that, prop, um, that Poisson distribution tends to underestimate the draw. And there's a reason for that. And that is that the Poisson distribution is designed for independent events. It's basically saying all of the goals are completely independent from each other um, because you can use this distribution in, to solve many other problems. But of course, I would question here whether that is truly the case. Um, you know, is one goal independent of another? Um, that can vary quite dramatically depending upon the type of match that you're playing. So you tend to find that Poisson distribution underestimates the draw because of that. 
Uh, so my solution to this was to predict the draw separately uh, from the other score lines within the match. But you can also use other types of distributions um, to counteract this. And like I said, this is all part of how you choose to take this sort of information and this data and use of statistics forward. There are many ways of doing it. There's no one perfect way. Everybody has a slightly different take on it, either from the information that they input into the model or the way that the model outputs uh, the data. But yeah, if you want to know how to predict football score lines, this is a brilliant primer for you because it's telling you what data you need to look at, how you should gather that data, and then how you should put that into a model. So I hope what I've shown you here is um, how you can use historical data on football matches to project forward. We basically fit a model into the market, a curve, a distribution, a density function, a probability density function. Um, and that allows us to look at data and say, aha, if this is the case here, then this is what the outcome is likely to be. And of course, you know, one of the benefits of doing this is that you'll be able to do it in both directions. You'll be able to come up with your own odds based upon your own data, but you'll also be able to look at the market and say, this is what the market is discounting. And any discrepancy between the two, you can decide is going to be your edge or there has to be some sort of explanation behind it. But also remember the data that you put into it is quite important. So this is where I started sort of 30 years ago and my model has developed continuously from then. So when I look at a market, I use a whole range of variables that I plug into it uh, that allow me to uh, accurately predict or more better predict the outcome of an individual match. Because there are flaws with different types of models and lots of people sort of position this as something uh, particularly special, but it is something that is actually well known. And you can get access to the data quite easily. And as you will see, if you download the spreadsheet that I mentioned in this video, you'll be able to get hold of all of that data and the predictions fairly easily. So it's more important that you look at the information that you put into it and you change some of the angles on that in order to get a more accurate outcome. So, you know, is the manager changed the playing style? Is there a key player injured? Are these two teams have a certain history uh, between them? And is that likely to replicate? Is there an incentive for them to do a certain thing or re achieve a certain result or not? All of those things will make a big difference to the output of the model. But hopefully what I've showed you here is how to take historical data, use uh, that data and a couple of formulas to be able to predict what the likely outcome is given that data set. And of course, from there, you can take it on to whichever level you wish to do so. And in fact, if you look at the way that I analyze uh, data now, I'm more interested in the relative attacking and defensive styles of individual teams. And I will tend to use that data rather than just goals now to be able to predict what's likely to happen in the next match. But yeah, I hope that that video has been useful for you.